Hello, everyone. My name is Jill Renee Feeler, and welcome to today's podcast. I am so glad that you're here. We had a another event yesterday for the members. We did a live Q and A. Um, it was an Ask Me Anything, and I haven't done one of those. Um, oh God, <laughs> it's just not my preferred format. But in that members group, the questions were so amazing. They were so cosmic and existential, and yet very practical and facing divorce and uh, feeling, you know, psychically attacked and the the answers that came through were amazing. So anyway, you may want to check that out um, and become a member. <laughs> but before we get started here, let's just do a brief connection exercise so that you can feel <laughs> yourself hopefully beyond your five human senses. Okay, so I encourage you to close your eyes and focus on your breathing, relax your body. And on this next breath, I would like you to imagine that there is a beautiful white ball and it's just below your heart space. Nice. <clears throat> so that white ball is going down and it's going up. It's going down and it's going up through like a column of energy within your body. Very good. And it's just floating, just going up and down, just helping you realize that there is a, a flow of energy within you, within yourself, not you to something outside of you, not you to a, a source energy that's better and brighter than you. That's not you, <laughs> just you. Okay. Just you is great. Okay. Very good. And now that white ball of energy, as it goes down, it goes down below your feet. And now it, it's almost like it's popping right back up. Like if you were holding a ball underneath the water, it wants to pop back up and now it's going higher than your body, probably by about two feet, this imaginary white ball. And now it's just almost like somebody has its hands on it. It's going right into your head. <laughs> it's not, it's not uncomfortable. It's just imaginary. Okay, good. And as it's there, it's losing its, its edge, its boundary. So now it's transforming from a ball to a beacon of light right within your head. And now please put a smile on your face, even if you don't want to. <laughs> and let this ball, this, excuse me, the source of light now get big enough where it actually encompasses as wide and as tall as you are. where with the right vision, somebody would look at you and only see the source of light. Sort of like when we look at the sun, it's hard to see its edge. It's all we see is just this emanation of light. Okay, very good. Mm. Okay. Ooh, all right. Okay, what else do we want to do in this connection exercise here? We've got the light turned on inside of you. We didn't have to pull anything from the outside in, did we? Very nice. Perfect. We love it this way. Let's let you feel the, the coolness of this light, that it's not hot. It doesn't melt. It's, it's just there. And it's almost like refreshing, kind of like a nice cold drink on a hot summer day. Nice and refreshing. <clears throat> it's not heavy. It's not oppressive. It doesn't um, mask out who and what you are. It actually helps loosen up in some ways who and what you are. Very good. Okay. <sighs> okay. Okay. Next step. Let's imagine that this light turns into a beautiful icy blue color. Speaking of coolness, a nice cool icy blue. And now if you imagine more closely into the source of light that is, that is now fully in coordination with your humanness, there's actually every color you can imagine. 
colors that are indescribable in this reality. They're just spellbinding. Hmm. There we go. And now if you can imagine below the soles of your feet, that cool icy light is almost like holding the soles of your feet, helping uh, recharge you and hopefully reinvigorate you <laughs> for whatever's next in your life. Okay. And it's also asking you to let go of anything that you're racking your brain over and trying to figure out what if, what if it doesn't need to be figured out, whatever that is, what if you can just set that problem or that puzzle or that challenge to the side for at least a, at least an hour <laughs> as we hang out together. You may decide it's not even as important as you may have maybe thinking it is. Okay, let's set down those challenges. Let's let ourselves feel that light charging us up from the inside out. Reinvigorating our sense of self, our sense of purpose, and this almost endless possibilities, not just for this reality, but who and what we are in this reality. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay, so please wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers. If you haven't opened your eyes already, you may want to open your eyes. <sighs> okay, nice. <laughs> okay, oh, that feels really good. I like those longer meditations. Um, early on when we first started and we did like remembering workshops around, I think it was 2012. I think we did those for a year or two. Um, some of those meditations are like an hour. Um, they're, they're really, <laughs> we went, we went way deep and I, I love those. Um, yeah, they're still available in the archives. So anyway, okay. So for those of you that are new here, welcome. Um, I love, um, considering and maybe reconsidering what we are capable of within our human selves, within our human lives, within this reality. And, um, that I do, I want to say sense, but I also know that there is a, possibility for actual glory within every single life form. And I love to um, sort of help hold that up for each other so that we can see it more clearly so that we can um, just let go of the, the sense of self that is limiting our ability to, to access that sense of divine inspiration and that sense of um, almost otherworldly sort of possibilities getting extremely creative, getting extremely productive, getting maybe hyper focused and less distracted um, in our own energy fields about who and what we are and what we care about and what we want to make a difference um, in or on um, in our lives and in this world. So many distractions in this reality, right? Okay, so anyway, that's what we do. Alrighty, so I am going to be sharing a message today, and I think we're going to be talking a little bit more about consciousness. In the previous podcast, we talked about thoughts and the nature of thoughts. We talked, um, what else did we talk about? Several things. <laughs> anyway, um, you may want to go check that out. But today, I feel like what we're going to be talking more about is consciousness as it relates to self identity. Okay, so I'm excited for whatever we're going to do today. Okay, I don't have notes. I don't have a script. I just go within and it's almost like these ideas and concepts and <clears throat> I look at it as wisdom and I hope it's helpful um, sort of pops up uh, within myself. So it's fun this way. All right. When we, when we consider consciousness, we look at individual possibilities, individuated opportunities that are unique to you relative to someone else. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not fans of this idea of this mass consciousness, like a, like a big ball of everything that you, that you can get stuck in or that you want to be part of this global brain <laughs> or cosmic mind. Um, what is the fun in that? Where's the individuality in that? Where is the uniqueness in that? Um, it's so much more fun this way. And it, what, the way that we're describing consciousness to you is meant to inspire your greatness and your creativity 
and your passions and your interests. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're going to talk about propaganda too uh, today and, and why that works um, and how to help it not work as easily for you. Um, how to be less influenced and less gullible maybe by um, an agenda of others that may not be for your um, best self and may not be for the best self of anyone. It may be purely to distract um, and confuse and inspire chaos and things like that. Okay, so I'm going to put the agenda, put the, uh, the propaganda piece <laughs> into the side for a minute. <sighs> when we speak of individual consciousness, we notice that that, ins that invokes fear in some people because they don't have a grasp or a sense of self that is defined enough to feel inspired or satisfied <clears throat> by this idea that, that you are your own consciousness and that you are your own one and that you may resonate with and hear and know similar things to what other people are, are thinking and getting and knowing and you know, believing is true for them. Um, and the similarities are fine, but some of you have really um, oversimplified your sense of who and what you are you are deliciously complex and every human is every form of life deserves the level of complexity that it is not just to better understand itself or for a being that wants to have more self-awareness but also to help <clears throat> one access more of those um scenarios and uh, probabilities and going off track, maybe from what they've been, okay? So this, this freedom, this sovereignty that we, we just cherish, <laughs> especially within the human form, um, is, is just the epitome to us of enlightenment because it is, it is so individuated and so... <sighs> indescribable in all the best ways so the mind's desire the human mind's desire to simplify and um, stratify <laughs> and diagnose and um, fix and solve and characterize things in neat little boxes and I'm like this group and I'm part of that group and I agree with these guys and I don't agree with those guys um, is such a, a trap for limiting yourself. Oh. <laughs> but some of you have a personality that actually feels more comfortable and less fearful and less, you feel more like yourself in the midst of a group. So there are compromises that you've made along the way that you may not even realize. And that's something you may want to just take a step back from and consider. And let's play with it this way. For a group that you completely align with, can you think of one or two things that you actually don't agree with them on? Come on, there's got to be something. <laughs> we know that there's something in there. And we encourage you to feel that sense of liberation that you are not just like them no one is just like you that's the glory that we're talking about that's the individuation of light that we're trying to further activate and expand and hold up for you so why is it so scary to disagree with anyone? Why, is it, why would it be scary to disagree with yourself? It doesn't have to be. Part of you may feel very triggered by that, by being rebellious or by being a troublemaker, <clears throat> by slowing things down. I mean, who knows the many reasons you may have for why you are pretending to fully agree with certain groups or certain individuals. 
There's probably a lot of intelligent, rational, practical reasons there. But when you can make more room for being uncomfortable in yourself, you will notice and be much more aware of not just you, but of everyone. That it's, it doesn't have to be a problem to see a point of contention. It can just be a point of contention without any feelings associated necessarily attached to it of good or bad or right or wrong or uh oh, that means we may not like each other anymore. Anything like that. We're, we're better than that now, right? You're more mature and humanity is more mature in its evolutionary phase, yes? To be able to disagree, to be able to have contention, to be able to recognize within yourself where you stand alone from everyone. That is terrifying to some of you. <clears throat> And to others, it's exactly where they're at the most homey, <laughs> that they're in their one and that they recognize that it looks like I'm going to be doing a lot of editing with this video too. Darn it. <laughs> it's okay. Um, for some people, there is just this comfort level with distinction and variety and disagreement. Disagreement doesn't have to mean dislike. Isn't there somebody that you like that you disagree with on something that matters to you, but you like them anyway? Why is that? Part of it's you and part of it's the other person because the other person isn't saying or isn't inferring that in order to like me, you need to agree with me on everything, right? Some people have that sort of approach to their relationships. It's you know, take it or leave it. You got to, you know, accept all of me or accept none of me. We have to agree in order for us to have any meaningful bond. And then there's other people that are sort of like, yeah, we're going to disagree on stuff. It's okay. It's all right. They're inviting you into not agreeing with them on anything, but yet still having some sort of um, uh, connection that is enough to have mutual like, maybe even mutual love, mutual bond, shared interests, etc. Okay, so now we're gonna, and that was quick, <laughs> we're gonna slide right into the propaganda part. Let's give our definition of propaganda. Propaganda is the intentional slanting of information to invoke a certain response in the receiver. It knows it's not presenting the full picture and it is totally okay with that. It wants a certain outcome and it will go to deception, manipulation, even lies, maybe it's just lies of omission in order to get that outcome, that feeling, that reaction, that buy-in, that agreement um, with a certain individual or a certain group. It's very dangerous. Every war on earth ever going backwards in present time have used propaganda of some sort in order to get its citizenry to go along with it. It's a narrative, a very, very crafty, calculated, strategic narrative to get a group to say, we don't have a choice. We've, we've got to go in there. <clears throat> we've got to fight this. So unless an individual is willing to, and this is the critical point, Think for themselves. Question a narrative, no matter who delivers it. Be aware of your, your own natural intelligence factors, whether it's your gut instinct, 
your brain a feeling center, a clairsentience even, just a sense of uneasiness, like, I don't know, something feels off here. That's enough. <laughs> That's enough to create a crack in you to go beyond the propaganda that's being handed to you. Thinking for oneself is not a narrative on earth. We look at the school systems and the sense of we're all going to do this together, right? Is it effective? That's questionable. <laughs> Is it um, more efficient to kind of pretend that everybody is going to get to the same outcome by teaching it the same way? It's, it's more efficient, but it's a game, right? And actually those that think for themselves at a young age are the most ridiculed, the most ostracized. <clears throat> They are, there's a spotlight of shame and like badness that is often shown very brightly, as brightly as possible on those individuals that are thinking for themselves, regardless of the, the quality of their thoughts, right? Whether they're right about something or wrong about something, originality is, is not appreciated, right? But if you look at all the greats, the glory that has shown within humanity in so many cases, whether it's Michelangelo, um, Tesla, right? Nikolai Tesla, Elon Musk even. <laughs> Poets, writers, philosophers. They had a sense of space within themselves where they not only thought for themselves, they valued their, their thoughts and their ideas and their creativity. They didn't need buy-in from other people for the most part as a kind of generalization here. <clears throat> they were all pioneers in, in their own way. That's why we still talk about them. That's why they made history. But yet all of them would probably have some story about how when they were growing up, um, they were punished or ostracized for being different or being themselves even, <laughs> right? So here you are in a dark age where most of you, the vast majority of you listening or watching to watching this would have gone through the system of education. And some of you would have had an easier time in that system than others, right? <clears throat> but what matters is where you are today. And that, that ability to think for yourself, that ability to disagree, that ability to have original ideas and um, concepts of original creations, that never went away. It's, it's actually unsuppressible, but some are very, very good at keeping a lid on it, like a really good lid on it, while there being some other version of themselves that was rewarded, that was encouraged, that was seen and heard and validated in their lives. This is why a group that would be listening to a, a so-called channeled message, this is why so many of you get flack. Because that group of, of maybe intelligent, vocal, um, <laughs> natural suppressors, <laughs> you guys didn't follow those rules. You didn't follow the same rules that they may have, and they're mad at you for it. So there's like a suppressed resentment that they have towards you, for, and they'll call you crazy. They may call you weird. Um, they may just make you, they may want to make you feel weird. They're, it's almost like there's this propaganda, <laughs> a subconscious propaganda program to try to get you to conform because it's easier for them if everybody is acting and thinking the way that they are. So the, the system can't, the system of humanity on earth in a dark age acts as if originality, independent thought, thinking for oneself, um, disagreement is going to be a, a load an unnecessary and overburdening load on the system, that the system can't handle it. It needs everybody to agree. That's not true. Um, of course it's not true, <laughs> right? 
Yeah, I'm just asking the team I'm stepping in here is, Joel, why isn't it true? Because societies have so much more room for flexibility than that. That's why it's not true. And those that are trying to control and coerce and manage, they don't like the outliers any more than a first grade teacher <laughs> would, it would, right? So it's, it's all the same sort of uh, herding cats sort of energy that they're feeling. And anyone, anyone's individuality that they can suppress, it's not malicious though. They're not doing it to be malicious. They're doing it to get their job done, which is try to teach you something and try to get that knowledge in your head and help make you a productive citizen and all those things. As if knowledge can do that. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry, it takes more than that. A lot more than that. So this, this sense of you guys, <laughs> any, we're speaking to anyone that would be listening or watching this and maybe smiling at this point, hopefully. Um, you've resisted for so long. And for somebody that, that sort of feels like you don't know why you're here, Maybe you're listening or watching this because you have put that lid on and you want to take it off. <laughs> Maybe your sense of who and what you are as an individual got lost along the way. And you may have been extremely productive, very successful, you know, poster child for, for goodness and greatness or, you know, accomplishment and something. But your sense of self is like a void. Who are you? What are you? What are your interests? Where are you free to disagree with somebody even that you love, like, or admire? Right? So that lid can be taken off at any time, but it's, it's upsetting to the system, right? Because that system, that rhythm that you have of conformity, you may not even realize how much it's there. And there may be very well-placed energy patterns that you have within yourself where you are trying to not look weird, not look stupid, not look unintelligent, and not be, um, you, you like the respect that you get for being maybe the conforming individual that you have been. So that resistance, the, the upset to the system is, oh my God, what could happen if I take this lid off? What if what if people call me crazy? What if, um, what if I lose friendships? What if I lose business deals? I mean, there's so many scenarios here, right? And I mean, that's good to look at all those scenarios. It's good to be aware of all those possibilities. Um, but you also probably have a track record and a reputation that you've accumulated that can serve you very well, the more out there <laughs> and unconventional that you may become. Yeah? Okay, that's exciting. <sighs> because how much, how much more amazing, how much more um, glorious could you be in your one, in yourself, if you start going back into that treasure chest of what made you stand out and what you like within yourself that you know is different than everyone else, right? I guarantee it's there. I guarantee there are distinctions and uniquenesses and differences and differentiation and who and what you are that make you the individual that you may not be able to see because you may not have wanted to see the distinctions between you and others. It's there. And when you take the lid off, <laughs> then you can see it more, right? You can give yourself that freedom to, well, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't, maybe that's not true anymore. Maybe what I have been acting as true as a belief or these facts indicate this is true, maybe those facts aren't as solid as they are. Maybe there's a whole other set of facts. Oh, I can sense the discomfort of some people like, wait a minute, she might be talking about this. I might be. What if I am? What are you right there wanting to protect and hold on to? What is that? Because you've identified who and what you are by that thing that you're not wanting me to be talking about. So let's just acknowledge that, okay? That I might be talking about that. And what if I am? What if your sense of value, purpose, meaning, is not attached to that thing, but you've been acting as if it is. 
isn't there something else that we can look at as an example in your life that you were sure was right, maybe not just right for you, but right for everybody, and you wore it passionately like a badge. <laughs> you, had the, you had the badge <laughs> that said, I'm this or I'm that. And then at some point you're like, eh, maybe I'm not. <laughs> maybe I'm not that. How that you made it through that, yeah? You decided to take off that part of your identity. You reconsidered it, decided that wasn't you anymore, and you moved forward in time with an adjusted, edited view of who and what you are. And with every single one of you that have shed some really important, at one point, ideas, the more comfortable you get that you are not your beliefs. You are not your ideas. You are so much more than that. You're this amazing, very dynamic, very complex, very indescribable, undefinable vessel of potential, potential ideas, potential beliefs, potential creation that can, that is dynamic enough to, to pretend that it is one thing for a while. And then at another point in its, in itself, say, Oh, actually, hmm, maybe, maybe I'm not that anymore. Maybe I was never just that, but I thought it was. Okay. All right. So the other part here to appeal to your intelligence, I have a major ringing in my right ear at a very interesting pitch. It's very high. So hmm. <laughs> we'll see what this means. Okay. For all of you that have become 100% certain, maybe even just over 95, any degree of certainty that's over 95% on something that the world is debating, this is going to be very uncomfortable for some of you to hear. We are certain that there was propaganda involved in it. That doesn't make you unintelligent. It doesn't make you gullible. What made you come to the conclusion about that you are 100% right and that anyone that disagrees with you is 100% wrong. The system that invited you into that certainty, when there has to be uncertainty, if, if there was certainty and everyone would agree with it, everyone would see it the same way. So there, there is contention. There is a different viewpoint. Are you refusing to see it? Leaving out a group of humans in the process. Because depending on how closely you identify with that thing, whatever it is, you have probably built up a camp between an us and a them. This isn't just politics. This is health. This is what, in, what you eat and don't eat. This is spiritual beliefs. This is religion. This is where you live. <laughs> this is what water you drink. I mean, the level of encampment, right? Oh, Samson's that's going to come in. I do want to get him. Hang on just a second. Okay. Because the level of encampment has separated you from some really, really um, interesting people that you probably would have more in common with than you realize. And those that you are in the, the camp or some would say tribes with, you probably have more disagreement than you realize. So let's address the part about the, how good it can feel for some of you to be in a camp, <laughs> to be in a tribe. It's the, the need to feel included. It's the need to feel right. Um, it's the need to feel like you're making a difference on something that matters deeply and personally to you, right? Those are really good reasons, right? But you're so much more than that. You were always more than that. So these badges and pins <laughs> of, of encampment that, well, I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this. What we love to encourage you to see is your infinite self isn't wearing those pins, doesn't have those badges. Your infinite self is much more 
maybe not neutral, but more open that there, that there is another opinion, that there are another set of facts which would lead somebody to come to a very different conclusion than you have. <clears throat> Your infinite self doesn't need you to be on the right side of that. It, it's totally okay that Earth allows for being wrong. <laughs> Earth allows for being uh, stubborn. Earth allows for being um, a participant, an unknowing participant in a propaganda um, sort of scheme. <clears throat> I take comfort in that, actually, that my infinite self is more neutral than I am about things that I'm, I'm quite maybe dogmatic about. That, that knowingness allows me to to step away from that truth or that belief and go, well, what if that's not true? What if I'm wrong about this? Then what? You know you're onto something when there's no identity crisis <laughs> that follows after that. There's just a sense of, oh, that would be interesting. There's a curiosity and a sense of that you are still you and that you are in a, in a moment of reevaluation, <laughs> okay? about the badges that you wear and the pins that you have on or whatever, right? The camps that you call yourself a part of. The other, there's many dangers with propaganda. Um, obviously, when it comes to wars, unnecessary life, it's unnecessary loss of life, unnecessary invest, investment economically. It's such a, I mean, some would look at it as, oh, your economy is rising because there's all this defense spending. Um, but another way of looking at it, but what else could we have spent that money on? Um, it could have been spent anywhere and we happen to spend it on defense. So if there were another compelling um, uh, winning idea that was a better way to spend that money, then there would be no economic um, detriment of not declaring war or disengaging from various operations in the world. Right? So there's not even an economic argument really for that promotes this um, military industrial complex as Dwight Eisenhower called it. Okay. There are some signs of the um, propaganda machine at work within you. Okay, so let's point out some of them. You're afraid to be wrong, number one. Number two, you're not afraid of being wrong because you're 100% certain that you're right, right? That's a, that's a problem. We don't have that kind of certainty on earth, you guys. We don't have that degree of accuracy at almost anything. Very few things are we 100% certain, right? I'm 100% certain it's day outside right? For me, right? But I'm also 100% certain that on the other side of the globe, it's nighttime, right? So there are objective things that yes, you can know and yes, you cannot know. There's a whole bunch of other stuff where it's like, I think this is right. A lot of smart people, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of experts that say this is true, but it might not be true. And those experts, those scientists with the PhD and all the research and all those things, they act like, as scientists, they're always willing to let the data lead them. But on the other hand, it's so easy to see the agenda, unwillingness to be wrong, dogmatic thinking, propaganda even that they become a part of. Uh, funding, grants uh, sort of perpetuate that unnecessarily, but also just no one wants to be wrong, right? Very few humans are willing to be wrong about something, especially if they've been super vocal about it. It takes a very unique individual to be able to say about something they've been super, you know, public about and very well known for it. It takes a very special person to say, you know what, I, I now disagree with myself and here's why, right? But, oh, those are our favorite kind of people. <laughs> they really are. Because their objective of being honest and authentic supersedes their desire to be right. 
<sighs> okay, let's go back to the science of propaganda. Okay, there is a, a very clear line in your sense of self about the right group that you're a part of and the wrong group, those guys, right? That's a sign of propaganda. And propaganda also keeps feeding that because it loves camps. Propaganda has specific motivations for keeping camps in their camps. And their biggest fear is that they're gonna lose somebody, right? So their main motivation is to grow the camp and keep the camp, right? Keep what they have and grow more, right? And then they will very crafty, you know, in a very, again, um, manipulative way, slant the facts, slant their interpretation of things. And if anybody in that camp is not willing to say, wait a minute, there's something feels off about that, or that maybe that's not true. That's the perfect starting point. What if that's not true? <sighs> okay, so why are we talking about this? <laughs> because there are so many distractions and there are, there's all this human potential within every single human. And this ideology of, of, well, it has to support this truth or this belief or, or I don't want to be a part of it. What if that's like the breakthrough that's needed? If, whether it's curing cancer or, or who knows what. There's a lot of problems that need to be solved. Climate change, right? There's a lot of, you know, uh, there's so many global issues that are a, a problem and need to be addressed. Human health. Oh my God, <laughs> right? So this freedom for more and more individuals to step out of their camps and into themselves and say, what if we're wrong? What else might be true? What if neither camp is right? Even if there's normally there's two camps in these things because they're easier. It's easier easier to pick A or B and manage those, right? Um, C tends to get drowned out. The the third one, the third leg, um, just by nature. So this this option of more and more people stepping outside of that, in again whatever you wanted to protect when we started talking about this, that's the perfect place to start. What if you're wrong about that? Are there a whole bunch of people that you've talked to about that thing? Maybe even not in a very public way, but in your Facebook circle, um, in your communities, with your family and friends. How embarrassing might it be to say, you know, I've been rethinking that and I don't, I'm not so certain I was right about that. And I don't, it, it may not even be that you flipped to the other camp. It may just be that you've decided that, that you don't know and that maybe neither camp really knows. Maybe this is more complex of a problem than either camp was giving credit because the propaganda skirts around those uncertainties and goes for the really strong narrative. That's why it works. It's so good. So yeah, a part of you might be embarrassed. A part of you might feel relief that, oh my God, that's so like, whoo, thank God. Because all the energy that's put towards living the propaganda in, in an unconscious way, that's energetically draining. And talk about a lid on your originality and individuality. Um, that's a really, really like a pressure cooker kind of lid that you gotta twist and lock, <laughs> make sure it's locked. Okay, so you start loosening that structure up and being willing to be wrong. Um, I'm just stepping in here as Jill. I, I totally get this because I remember I was always one of those people that really, I always thought of myself as intelligent and smart and, um, and savvy and uh, cutting edge maybe in some ways. And I hated to be wrong. I also hated to lose, which is very, very closely related, right? I would pout for a really long time if I lost Candyland at age four. No one in my family wanted to play with me. Oh my God, I'm just giving that version of Jill a big hug because her whole sense of importance was just crushed. It's just like decimated at the idea of losing Candyland. <laughs> But I was always hopeful, like, no, 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 oh, I'll be good this time. You know, I promise I won't get upset if I lose. But really what I was saying is I know I'm going to win. So it won't even be an issue. I don't have to be a good loser because I'm going to be a winner. 
And then when I would lose, it would just be like, oh, <laughs> you know? And I would, anyway, I can't, I don't even know what <laughs> I put my, my sweet family through. Um, yeah, that's so crazy. So I know, I know that way of being and I just, I can laugh at it now that, that I, I had so, this is so a before and after for me and I completely get it. Whatever spectrum of, of needing to be right and willingness to be wrong um, without it being a, a, a you know, crushing blow to your ego or sense of self. I, I, I think I've been wide, wide along that, slid along that scale quite a bit. And I can tell you, I just, now when I get something wrong, I'm like, oh. And I'm just, I literally get a smile on my face like, oh, that's amazing. Wow. And I just sort of am contemplating like, like, wow, I was so sure about this, this, and this. And now that I've heard another side or I'm more open to more evidence or new data, I'm just like, oh, wow. Okay. So I'm willing to reconsider my whole, my whole, my individual position on that. Now, will people get mad at you? Yeah, because that propaganda at keeping those camps in place is so freaking good. It's, it's like a cult, <laughs> right? Like Scientology. Once you're out, like, no, you can't get back in and you'll never speak to any of us again. We will destroy you. <laughs> you're the enemy now, right? Oh my God. It's so, it's diabolical if you really think about it. But this is, happens all the time. Again, between like vegans and, and omnivores, between, you know, the, the, the vaccinators and the anti-vaxxers, between the Democrats and the Republicans, between the, the leave the EU and the, the stay. I mean, this, there's just a handful of examples. They're everywhere. They're everywhere, right? Oh, abortion versus, you know, uh, pro-choice. Uh, the right to own firearms in the USA versus the, um, the anti-gun folks. I mean, it's just, oh my God, it's just everywhere. So when you can step back and go, you know what? I actually get it. I get that they have an opinion. I get that they have an opinion. I get that they know they're right. I get that they know they're right. And that isn't fixing the problem. That's the thing. The camps are lying to themselves that if they had their way, everything would be fixed. That is so not true. But the, the, the orchestrators of those camps will never say that because they're incented to keep the camps operating. And the camps may morph, etc. but as long as no one leaves, right? So they may shift their position in certain ways, but it's, it's still that camp and it may morph and evolve and things like that. But, but the idea that, that if one group just had their way, the problem would be solved is just so simplistic and so untrue. It's so much bigger than that. It's so much bigger than that. That's, that to me isn't, isn't scary as much as the lies that are told. Those to me are much scarier. To me, it's much safer to go, you know what? <laughs> there've been other, like there's, there's cracks in that, in that logic and I'm willing to look at it and just go, I don't think they're hundred percent right. And I don't think they're hundred percent right. I'm just going to stand here in my one. And if there's individuals that are kind of, as they get to know me, quiz me on where I am on these certain issues. And then they decide to ostracize me or, or I'm not um, enlightened because I eat meat or, you know, whatever. Um, I've become more and more okay with that because if that's what it would have required is agreement on that thing for us to be friends or have a relationship or have some sort of common bond, whatever, then if that's what was required, I don't want that relationship. I don't need those strings attached. I'm not asking that of them, but they're asking that of me. So as I sort of clip, clip, clip more and more of those threads and ties of connection, um, do I feel more alone? No, I feel more one. <laughs> That's what I feel. Um, and I like, I'm a, I'm a good thinker. So I actually like to have an, <laughs> an inner debate or an inner dialogue about, about why both camp would be in the camps that they're in. I totally get it. I don't see any one of them as idiots. And that, by the way, has been a huge raise in vibration, right? 
I find it very ironic that in enlightenment groups, there is this, this sense of, well, we're more expanded in our consciousness. And, you know, uh, so we should be able to, uh, to be more open and, you know, open to others' ideas and but maybe very opinionated in ourselves. I find it really interesting how dogmatic things can become when the propaganda identifies a common threat for that camp or what becomes that camp that they lose, I mean, all of their rules of, of expanded consciousness, all of their sense of individual oneness, recognizing and cheering on the sovereignty within others is just gone. If the lid is put on it, we don't have time for that now, Jill, I'm sorry. We've got to be haters. <laughs> we have to fight that group because this threat is so dangerous that anything we said before about you know, seeing the light of God in others and um, et cetera, we're, we need to put those values and truths to the side because there's no time for that now. This is a war. Is it really a war? Or is someone making it feel like a war? And the more you hang out in that camps, the more you're being dripped the propaganda. God, it's just, it's so weird. Why are we so gullible? There's a lot of good reasons. Um, I mean, I don't like them, but there's a lot of valid reasons for why we easily go along with something. I mean, patriotism, it depends on what our values are, right? Um, fear of something can be a really strong motivator. Love of something can be a really strong motivator. And the propagandists use that. And there's propagandists on all sides. Yeah, so... God, it's just so twisted, <laughs> right? There's not only at the, at the propagandist level, I'm not going to get into Agenda 21 and all that stuff because I feel like that is oversimplified <laughs> and there's too much credit given to that notion as a conspiracy. Um, I'm not saying none of it's true. I'm saying it doesn't have the... Oh, that's big. Thank you. I'm saying it's never going to be enough to override the free will and individuality. And it's very true to me that a message like this that helps us think for ourselves is the best antidote to something like Agenda 21. The best. Because that's where your greatness, <laughs> because that's where your greatness resides, is in your individuality, in your oneness. There's glory within the human system. We are capable of so much more than any of those systems will, will tell you is possible. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I didn't, I didn't see that connection <laughs> to Agenda 21 coming. Yeah. And I'm not an expert in that. Uh, but the, 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 part that I've seen of it is just like, well, that's not 100% true. So I didn't want to get closer to it. And I also feel like a lot of those, it's a, it's a, it's a rabbit hole. It's a, it's an encampment thing, right? To put you in that camp of flat earthers. That's another one, right? The flat earthers versus the, the non-flat earthers, right? There's just, there's a growing number of encampments going on here. And it's like, oh my God, it's just like, well, what could we be doing <laughs> if, if we decide that that isn't going to make the difference we think it will, and that the problem is bigger than that, well, then what, what would we spend our time in? What would we offer our energies to? What would we do with ourselves? See, I like that idea <laughs> that, that there's then free will and free time uh, sort of um, brought back online for, for all of us as ones. For what would we do if we weren't worrying and fighting that battle anymore? What if that battle wouldn't have the effect we thought it would even if we did win? Because it's more complex than that. So I don't like autism any more than anybody else. But I am not convinced as Jill that it's the vaccines. And see, some of you are like, oh, she's out, <laughs> right? So you, you're proving to yourself, right? Exactly what we're talking about here. I still love you. <laughs> Whether you're in either camp, if I see an anti-vaxxer or a pro-vaxxer, I'm not like, oh, we can't be friends. I'm like, I get it. I get it. I love this way of being and I highly recommend it to anyone because this encampment thing is really, really pulling humanity apart at the seams unnecessarily. 
And the only way to, uh, that's a little emphatic, I'll say it this way and then I'll dial it back if I need to and correct it. <clears throat> the only way to solve these really big problems is for us to be working together. And if we're hating each other, and even though we say, well, I don't hate them, really? Sure. It's maybe call it something else, but there's definitely a, an us and them, right? Trump voters versus non-Trump voters. Yeah. Barry supporters, or Bernie, <laughs> Barry. Bernie Sanders supporters versus non-Bernie Sanders supporters. Socialists versus capitalists. I mean, the, there's no end to the encampments that we have here. And I guarantee that you are bigger than any encampment that you're in. How I see you and how I know you as an infinite energy is bigger than all of those combined and all of it. What freedom might you feel by having less of a temptation to even be a part of a camp? But you'll lose all your friends. That's a personal decision for you, right? <clears throat> Would you have to? Maybe, maybe they could evolve too. <laughs> maybe they could uh, rethink things for themselves about, well, maybe, maybe I could be friends with somebody that doesn't agree with me on that issue. Maybe this isn't a make or break. Maybe this isn't a deal breaker, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the more I interact on the transcendent of camp nature, the more I like my fellow humans. It's, it's so much, I like myself better as Jill when I'm giving people the credit they deserve that everybody's trying to do the best they can with what they know. Everybody, absolutely everybody. Why want an exception to that truth? Okay. <laughs> All righty. So <laughs> we covered a lot today. I did like where we went. I'm just giving high fives <laughs> to all of us here. That was, I like where we went. How are you guys doing? Those of you that are in the chat, um, maybe you want to ask a question about any of this or share an aha moment that maybe you had or um, whatever. How are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm here. I'm going to get a sip of water. <clears throat> and while folks are typing in the chat room, those that are live, I will make an announcement that on Thursday, August 8th, is the monthly members. Um, we have a message that we share once a month with that group, and we happen to pick August 8th. And I, I don't get that in. I don't get into that whole Lionsgate thing. But I, then I saw invitations to other people's Lionsgate events. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. August 8th, Lionsgate. I'm like, what is the Lionsgate again? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's right. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool that I didn't even know we were picking the date and it was the Lionsgate, but I'm really happy it's the Lionsgate. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited for what comes through on August 8th. Um, what else is going on? We are still, we still have spots for Greece and Zion and Egypt for anyone that wants to travel with me. Um, there's a special offer available right now through Beyond the Ordinary. Um, so that's a, a great deal. That's um, a great way to get a discounted private session. And the materials in that are from the Boise workshop that we had in April, um, <clears throat> where, I mean, amazing things happened. Prince, um, the artist known as Prince, actually came through. I know that sounds crazy to someone, and not me. <laughs> to me, it was like, wow. Um, what Prince described for us and laid out for us about what happens in the afterlife how confusing it is and how to transcend those corridors to yeah transcending the afterlife programs it was just like oh my god so the level of specificity and his confusion that he had initially and how he dealt with it and the decisions he made and how it worked um <laughs> I, w I really want everyone to hear that message diane is asking jill it seems you point to creating something new versus reacting to groups, politics, and viewpoints. Being reactive keeps us in a limited version of ourselves. Uh, I don't know if I understand the question. Okay, Nicole was answering though. She says, yes, I think so. I feel it closes you off to your higher self. Okay, it seems, Jill, it seems you point to creating something new versus reacting to groups, politics, and viewpoints. I don't, and being, being reactive keeps us in a limited version of ourselves. I guess I don't have a negative feeling about being reactive. 
maybe I like the word responding more than reacting. Um, but I just, so maybe we're saying the same thing, Diane. I don't know. Maybe you want to ask it another way because I'm not quite clear on what you really want to know <laughs> in your question. And maybe you could uh, ask it another way and I'll, I'll hear it better. Okay. Sarah's saying, are you saying we shouldn't have opinions and preferences? No, I'm saying you should have opinions and preferences and that they be your own regardless of alliances that you may have had with certain groups or certain individuals, um, any of those things. I am such a huge fan of having an opinion where you have an opinion. And sometimes that opinion can be, you know what, I don't think anyone really knows the answer <laughs> to what to what causes autism or ADHD or any of those, any of that spectrum. Um, I don't think we know the cause. I think it's more complex than that. Um, but we don't have... I mean, the data can even be manipulated. So that's frustrating too, because normally in a, in a normal, <laughs> in a non-dark age, it would be, well, what does the data say? But data and studies, I mean, any of us that have, that have taken any statistics course or created any sort of studies know that they're very, the outcomes can be very indicative of something, but then the generalizations of, so it means this are very exaggerated sometimes. Um, and that's unfortunate. I mean, you'd think that we would have a good study of autism cases. And I mean, it would really, there, yeah, there's just so many ways you could design a study that would be more neutral to actually being open to whatever the data did say. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and then Nicole is saying, I think Diane means if you react out of unconsciousness. Well, anything in unconsciousness is do for an upgrade, <laughs> right? So anything that's done without thinking um, that may have negative consequences on self. I mean, yeah, let me, let me talk back. Let me walk that back just for a second because there's a lot of things that we do in a so-called unconscious manner, whether it's getting in your car and starting your car. You're not as aware and conscious of getting in your car, closing the door, putting on the seatbelt, and those things as maybe you were as a brand new driver, right? There's things that go on autopilot, which could be deemed unconsciousness, but here's the thing, they're not harmful. And they're, the, you have a system down that works for you. I guess my, our point is there are some things that people have down pat in terms of their beliefs and their ideologies that they're actually, they might be wrong on. And if they stepped back a little bit from that camp or from that propaganda, they may reconsider and re come to a very different conclusion and a different opinion for themselves. Thinking for yourself does not mean you don't have an opinion. Thinking for yourself means that your, your opinions are your own based on, yes, you heard the propaganda, but yes, you allowed yourself to question it or you allowed yourself to disagree with it on both camps, both sides that you on both sides are like, I think they, meh. <laughs> they might be wrong about that. They might be wrong about that. That's a good sign that you are, that you are transcended the camps in that regard that you have an, maybe an original opinion or maybe an opinion that you used to disagree with, but now you're like, you know what? They might be right about that. There's a lot of things we won't know who's right. There's so many things that, I mean, God, there's vast majority of the things that we cannot agree on in the human race right now. We don't agree on and we may never agree on. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Hmm. Okay. I hope that helps Diane if, with your question too. Okay. Kaylee, Kaylee, you have a nice pattern here of focusing on health. I like that about you. How is health different in a light age versus a dark age? There is so much unknown in this time. And I'm curious how this can shift and change <laughs> moving forward. Thanks, Jill. It's easier <laughs> and it doesn't have to just be easier in a, in a enlightened age in a dark age. It can be easier too especially when you're giving yourself permission to think for yourself, right? So this idea that, that, that this is bad for this reason and nobody should eat that way, right? And I've walked back from some of those ideas about, you know, well, fruits, the, you know, basically nature's candy and you can't have fruit. And I'm just like, you know, and maybe it's not as, maybe it's not as, 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 uh, villainous as I was, as I was pretending it was. But when I feel amazing and I'm in a state of ketosis, that is my truth that no, 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 you shouldn't have fruit or I shouldn't have fruit or no one should have fruit because you feel so good in that system. Now, now I notice that I need to create a new system because 
ketosis isn't having the same effect for me that it did before. Um, so does it mean it didn't work before? No, it did work before. <laughs> I've, got the, I've got the pictures to prove it and my memories of how amazing I felt to prove it. Yeah, good times, good times. But for some reason, and who knows what, I'm a complex system, you're a complex system, this is a complex world. There could be so many valid reasons for why ketosis is not ideal for me anymore. I don't know. I, I'm open to the possibilities that it's not working the way it used to. The things I used to do to get the results are not working, which is similar to how I ever found ketosis. Because in my teens and 20s and 30s and 40s, well, I'm 49 now, so maybe just up to about 42. <laughs> when I felt like my body was getting in a state that I didn't like it in terms of maybe you know, clothing size or just how much, how much fluff I feel <laughs> around my waist, my little strategies for how to get things back into gear, they just stopped working at <laughs> 42. And I'm just like, oh shit, <laughs> I gotta try something totally new. Um, so I did ideal protein at one point and then I did ketosis and yeah, so they both worked for me. Yeah, anyway, so I gotta find something new. No, it's, it's, I'm not afraid about it. I'm just like, yeah, I'm open to trying something else. Um, and it's not my number one priority right now. So it's not like the number one thing I'm focused on. So I had Chick-fil-A last night <laughs> with my daughter and her friends. So I'm relaxed. I'm more relaxed than I was before. But I do have that fluff. Damn it. But I'm okay. I, I have fluff. So what? I've got some fluff around my middle. I still like myself. Okay, so... Oh, oh, we got more here. Okay, so it's easier in a light age because what works is more, because what works for oneself is more acknowledged and easier to identify than it is in a dark age where there's all these sort of, and this is what the camps and the propaganda does, it competes for who's right versus just what if we all kind of have a, a good idea that they we're working with something good on all the, in all these camps, but I gotta find what's right for me. Um, when it comes to food or something like that. So it, in the light age, you don't have as many people saying, oh my God, you eat meat? Oh, what's wrong with you, right? Um, there's not that sense of um, imposing one's truth on somebody else because they know what's right for everybody. There's more acknowledgement of, oh, you feel good with meat? Oh, that's interesting, I can't eat meat. I don't feel well with meat. And maybe that's not even true for that person, but that's their current truth. And if they're feeling great, then hey, that's great, right? Whatever makes you feel good. Um, not feel good, but be good, right? Whatever makes you be good, you like yourself more, and a sense of um, you are living up more closely to the potential within ourselves, and you're not harming anyone else in the process or waggling your finger <laughs> at them, which I might have done a little bit today, and I'll, I'll, I'm totally owning that because I'm super opinionated <laughs> about this topic. Um, so I'm glad what came through. Okay, uh, Lori is asking, what are your thoughts about 12-step programs? They support many people in overcoming addictions by identifying being powerless over blank and their life is unmanageable. The second step, uh, say to believe, the second step, say to believe, is power greater than yourself to restore you to sanity. It saves many people's lives from suffering in their addiction. Um, I'm going to start there first. <coughs> I have a lot of respect for 12-step programs because I do feel like they have helped a lot of people out of a really scary dark hole. Um, and I don't, I don't know those dark holes. I haven't done a 12-step program. I, I don't suffer from addictions like that. So I just have so much compassion that there are people that get in dark holes. And I, I'm so glad that there's some sort of ladder out for them that they can follow and that is well regarded and they're not hopefully judged for. Um, there's not as much competing camps of you do 12 step program, oh my God, you know, you should do this. You know, hopefully there's not that. There's a sense of respect <laughs> that, okay, they, they've got a big challenge they're facing. Let's, let's let them work that out and pray that that works for them. Now, my opinion is, and I have helped um, those that are very well versed in 12-step programs, either they've done them themselves or they're, um, and or they now are an advocate of their, what is it called, a um, sponsor. Um, they're actually a sponsor in a 12-step system. I've spoken and had many clients 
that are in that situation and they hear me say things like, oh, we're not powerless, that, that we are empowered um, and the addiction is not more powerful than you. Um, and then they, they're like, you know, I kind of see what you're saying there because might it work, a 12-step program might work for somebody, but then at some point, I, as a champion of individual sovereignty and greatness within the individual, I, <laughs> I just have a very different flavor of ice cream of what I think may help them maybe after they're out of the hole, right? The hole might still be there though, and I'm not denying that fact that they may be, they may have a lifelong tendency toward whatever that addiction is, or maybe, maybe they'll replace one addiction for another and one's healthier than the one that they had before. That happens all the time. Um, food um, addicts, right? Whether they're a bulimic or an anorexic. I know more personal trainers that had anorexia or had or have, I don't know if it's a past tense, I don't know what's correct there, I'm not an expert, but I know a lot of people that are personal trainers that have experienced major food issues, anorexia, bulimia, those sorts of things. I think that's really interesting. And did they replace one addiction for another? Maybe. Are they healthier? That probably matters more to me than how they got there. And are they trying to help other people? Are they maybe overly dogmatic about it? And because that same system that was there when they had the anorexia nervosa or the bulimia or both, <laughs> that mindset of uh, maybe perfectionism and things like that is probably still in their repertoire of how they do things. So, yeah. By the way, everyone I know also that has or had or whatever experienced anorexia or bulimia very intelligent people it's interesting i don't have data like iq data but i think that's a really interesting correlation there too not causation but there's some sort of correlation there maybe it's the ability to overthink things okay so that's my opinion about that i do believe they work i do believe it would i would be i, I enjoy helping people see their sovereignty <clears throat> and feel more empowered over themselves and their addictions with the approach that we take. And I do wish there was an alternative to a 12 step program. <clears throat> and I, I, that was more aligned with my flavor of ice cream, but I'm not really motivated to create one, not because I don't care, but I don't think I'd be good at it. I'm not really great at creating systems. Um, because I'm so into customization <laughs> that this is the system you will follow. It is just not, that's that you're probably not going to get anything like that from me, but I'll toss out ideas of this could work and this could work. And these are some pathways. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Let me see the next part that she has here. And then I think we may wrap up. Any insight on addictions and tapping into a power greater than ourselves? Yes. Um, so I do have a, there's a blog post from a few years ago about, I think if you just um, do in an internet search, Jill Renee Feeler addictions, I think you'd get that, that uh, article. Um, yeah, man, addictions, that's, ooh. And we do have the Outwitting Watiko series, which also relates to addictions too in a, in a different twist, a different way. Okay, a spiritual, ex uh, this is still Lori, a spiritual experience is relied upon to overcome addictions. It seems to work well in supporting people by turning their will and lives over to the care of God as you understand God. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think it, it works for so many people and that's so awesome. It's so awesome. Is there possibly another way? I do believe there's another way. Oh, yeah, Tom. <clears throat> Okay, um, Tom is saying it's so frustrating when we've done more research and not listen to propaganda. For instance, 90% of greenhouse gas is water vapor, not carbon. So of course we should plant trees and we should never suck CO2 out of the air because it's vital for nature. And yet the CO2 argument has a lot of the best intending people applauding crazy tech to sequester carbon when they're actually siding with suffocating the plants. How do we get nuance back into these arguments that seem to have been co-opted by really unhelpful, <laughs> diplomatic word, agents so that the lovers of nature are getting the right information? I really miss nuance. Yes. <laughs> well said, Tom. Um, and let me go to your, your how part of that question. How do we get nuance back into these arguments? I mean, there's only so much we can do, right? But I... I mean, I think I wanted to do my part today, right? And I love your, your great word nuance. It's such a perfect word. Because now when I meet this, there is this 
Yeah, because of the encampment and the ideology and some things like that. Now, when I have somebody, and I don't have this actually that much anymore, I think somehow I'm, I'm out of the camps in a way that I don't get the you know, newsletter saying, um, make sure you don't vaccinate your kids, make sure you don't get the flu vaccine. I don't get any of that, you guys. So those of you that are in those camps, you may be surprised by how different the other camps information is that they receive, or somebody like the me that has never been in one of those camps in some cases, I get none of that propaganda stuff. So I hear it mainly from interacting with clients that are on either side or listening to podcasts and stuff. I'm like, oh, wow, they're really certain that that's true. They're really passionate about, about this or that, this side or that side. They really want us to change our behavior to, to what they think is right. Right. So it's very interesting. I think I could actually be a fun experiment to um, maybe at an event that we that you come to for me or something. We maybe if we have each other's phones and we look through our Facebook feeds or look through Twitter or go in our emails and just look through how different those worlds are. Right. Because of that propaganda machine. Wow. So, I mean, I hope that we did something here for uh, inserting and maybe teeing up more nuance in the sense of when I come across somebody, depending on the situation, um, if it's like a parent at school or something that's like, you know, oh, I hate it that Boise School District has an opt out for vaccines. Um, That's just so wrong. Everybody should get vaccinated, (laughs) right? If that were another parent, I would just be going, oh, (laughs) you know, I might say, well, there's another side to that issue. Um, if you want to talk about it, right? So I, cause I do sincerely, I hope you guys know this. I get both sides. I completely understand where each one is coming from. I get the mom that I just gave as an example, and I totally get the other mom. That's just like, you know, vaccines caused my, my boy to not be who he was prior to getting those effing boosters or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just, I, yeah. So maybe nuance is something I'm not expecting this to be fixed in in terms of the reduction of encampment, but I am hopeful that we can do better than where we are now. That's to me is a, is something that's worthy of hoping for fixing it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, (laughs) I'm not counting on that. Hey, Kaylee, she's just following up here to her um, nutrition and health question. She said, I love that answer, Jill. I'm trying to embody that and share that with others, giving each other permission to do what's right for our own bodies. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're right. Thank you. (laughs) Tom just, Tom just said, Oh, here's me being okay with being wrong. Here we go. (laughs) Tom just said that was Tony, not me, Joe, but I agree with Tony on that point. (laughs) And it sounded like you, Tom. That's so funny. So thank you, Tony, for your question. I was wrong. See, and there's no shattering of ego. I was wrong. (laughs) Totally. Okay. Admitting it big and small. Oh, that's funny. Tony just said, funny that some, someone else always calls me Tom <laughs> on his group calls as well. Is it a small font thing? Maybe I don't know, Tony, but I'm sorry. I apologize. I see you and I hear you as your Tony and not, that's not Tom. <laughs> and I love you too, Tom. Okay. Oh, I love you guys so much. Okay. So, uh, Jana, thank you for the uh, tip on my throat. I will, I, I can do that. Balls of it, honey and ground black pepper. Okay, I'm on it. (laughs) Okay, thanks you guys for being a part of this. This was a long one. This is going to take me a long time to export. Um, There's such a process with the video part. The audio parts is so much easier. But man, if you guys could be a fly on the wall as I do this thing and the the two an hour Q and A call yesterday that took nine hours to upload to Vimeo. Oh. <laughs> oh my god oh my god i love you guys i do it because i hope it makes a difference and supports you and your light here and i love you even if you disagree with me on anything and maybe even everything that i said today i love you no matter what because i see you as more than your beliefs and your truths and if you have some of the system that's working for you that's awesome if you 
are maybe wanting to shake things up and possibly get some upgrades, I'm never short of ideas on that. <laughs> it's my nature. Okay, I love you guys. Thank you so much. And for those that are going to join me again on Thursday, on August 8th, for the um, monthly members message that we do that happens to be on the Lionsgate, I am very excited for that and would love for you to consider joining that and participating. It, there's, it'll be live and an archive. Okay, all right. Bye-bye for now. <laughs> I love you guys. Bye-bye.